Okay, guys, I wanted to do another video here. Uh, we're going to kick off the uh, solubility chapter. And so there's several sections that we'll cover. And I'm going to focus this video on dissolution reactions. Uh, we need to be able to write out chemical equations for dissolution. And we're going to be learning how to write out the equilibrium constants for such, such uh, reactions. And then there'll be a number of calculations that we need to be able to perform using those equilibrium constant expressions. And so uh, this topic builds upon uh, content that we studied at the beginning of the course, specifically saturated solutions. So we'll be considering the saturated solution of an ionic compound that is not particularly soluble in water. Okay, uh, even though you know these compounds aren't aren't really classified as soluble, they do dissolve to some extent, and so there will be some dissolved lead and iodide ions in a saturated solution of lead iodide. It's just the concentrations will be very very small. Uh, it, this is a reversible reaction, and like any reversible reaction, we can write an equilibrium constant expression for it. For a dissolution reaction, the equilibrium constant is called an SP, KSP, where SP stands for solubility product. Uh, here you can see where it gets its name. It's just a product of ion concentrations. Uh, the reason why the reactants don't appear in the denominator of the equilibrium constant expression is because they are pure solids in all cases for dissolution reactions. And so, as we've learned previously, you don't include pure solids in your equilibrium constant expressions. So we call it a solubility product, and we give it the special symbol KSP. Now, the molar solubility refers to the amount of the solid that has dissolved to form ions. So the letter S refers to a moles per liter of this compound that has dissolved. And you can use the stoichiometry, the internal stoichiometry of the compound, to relate the solubility to the concentrations of the ions that are dissolved. So for example, if S moles per liter of this compound dissolve, then you will form S moles per liter of lead 2 ions in solution. Likewise, you will form 2S moles per liter of iodide because of the stoichiometric coefficient here. Okay, so there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the lead 2 iodide and the lead 2 ion. There's a one-to-two ratio between the compound and the iodide. Okay, and we take that account into account when we work with the KSP expression. So what we'll do is we'll substitute in the solubility as the concentration for the lead ions, and we'll substitute in two times the solubility as the concentration for the iodide. That gives us this here, which we can uh, simplify to give us 4s cubed. So there's a mathematical relationship between the KSP for the dissolution reaction and the value of the molar solubility. And you can almost anticipate the uh, types of problems that we're going to get. Uh, you can calculate KSP from the molar solubility, or you can calculate the molar solubility from the given KSP value. And so we'll work with both types of problems in this video. Like all equilibrium constants, uh, KSP depends on temperature. And so if you do your experiment at a different temperatures, you're going to have a different KSP value. That, in turn, will change the molar solubility of the compound. So in this example, what we're doing is practicing writing out dissolution reactions and uh, writing out the KSP expressions in terms of both the concentrations of the ions present in the dissolution reaction and the molar solubility. So for lead or for silver iodide, uh, silver iodide is a slightly soluble compound. It forms small amounts of silver ion and iodide in solution when it dissolves. The KSP for this reaction will be the product of the silver concentration times the iodide concentration. Because there's a one-to-one -one and a one-to-one -one relationship between the stoichiometric coefficients, if S moles per liter of the silver iodide dissolve, then the concentration of silver ion will be plus S, and the concentration of the iodide will be plus S. So we substitute those into the KSP expression, which gives us S squared. 
The calcium carbonate example is pretty similar, okay? Uh, and that's because the internal stoichiometry is, is the same. For every mole per liter of calcium carbonate that dissolves, you're gonna get one mole per liter of calcium ions and one mole per liter of carbonate ions. So substitute in the solubility for the calcium and the solubility for the, for the carbonate, and you get that S squared relationship as well. Now the two compounds will be different in the sense that the KSP values for each compound will not be the same. Uh, here the magnesium hydroxide is a little bit more interesting uh, because of this stoichiometric uh, factor of two. Uh, when the magnesium hydroxide uh, dissociates, you get magnesium ions and then you get two hydroxides. So there's a one to one ratio here and a one to two ratio there. So if S moles per liter of the magnesium hydroxide dissolves, then you're gonna get S moles per liter of magnesium and you will get two S moles per liter of the hydroxide. So we substitute those concentrations in for the magnesium ion, we substitute in S. For the hydroxide ion, we substitute in two S, multiply that out, and you get that the relationship KSP equals 4S cubed. Uh, I'm going to leave these other two as example problems for you to try, and then I have a whole other set for you to practice with. Uh, this type of activity is usually the first step in most of these solubility problems, and so we're going to see several examples in the other problems that I do work out. And so in this example, we're going to be doing some uh, numerical work with these KSP expressions. And so starting with the uh, part A here, okay, what do they want us to do? Well, we're taking fluorite, which is a slightly soluble compound. Uh, and what they're doing is they're telling us that the concentration of calcium in the saturated solution is this value. And the concentration of fluoride is this value. So we know the equilibrium concentrations they want us to calculate the KSP. Okay, so we take, uh, we, we look at the dissolution reaction. Okay, we find that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between fluorite and calcium ion, and a one-to-two relationship between the, between the fluorite and the fluoride. Okay, the KSP expression will look like this. KSP equals the calcium ion times the fluoride concentration squared. And what I want to point out here is that we're not working with the solubility in this problem they explicitly give us these concentrations, right? The calcium concentration is that number. The fluoride concentration is this number. We don't need to multiply anything by two in this problem because they gave us the concentration of fluoride explicitly. We just need to substitute those numbers in. And don't forget about the square. So you multiply all that out, and that gives you the KSP value for the fluoride. You see that it's a very small number, which is the case for most insoluble compounds. Uh, the small value of K indicates that this equilibrium reaction is shifted very far to the left. You won't have very many ions dissolved at equilibrium. There'll be some, they just aren't very large in concentration. Uh, let's work the magnesium hydroxide problem as well. So we have uh, a bit more interesting stoichiometry. In this problem, uh, you'll see that they give us the concentration of magnesium only and they want us to calculate the KSP. And the KSP relationship clearly requires us to have the hydroxide concentration, but they didn't give it to us. They only gave us the magnesium ion concentration. Well, here's where the solubility uh, comes in handy. So uh, you know that if S moles per liter of this dissolve, then you're gonna get S moles per liter of that. So by telling us the magnesium ion concentration, they've actually told us what the solubility is. Now, we can use that to determine the, the concentration for the hydroxide. So if S moles per liter of the magnesium hydroxide dissolves, then you're going to get two S moles per liter of hydroxide. So the hydroxide ion concentration is two times S. Well, since we know the value of S because we know the magnesium ion concentration, then we can easily calculate two times S. So we substitute S in for the magnesium, 2S in for the hydroxide. We expand it out and get that 4S cubed expression. And then we plug in the value of the solubility from the magnesium ion concentration. And that gives us the KSP, which again is very small for a slightly soluble compound. Uh, in this problem, we are going the other way. 
we are given the Ksp values for different uh, ionic compounds, and we're being asked to calculate the molar solubility, so going in the reverse direction. So for copper bromide here, copper 1 bromide, uh, you get copper and bromide ions. Uh, this is the Ksp uh, solubility product. Uh, you can substitute in S for each of these guys, giving you S squared. And now given the value of Ksp, you can solve this equation for the solubility just by taking the square root of both sides. And so you get that the solubility is 7.9 times 10 to the minus fifth moles per liter. Uh, the silver iodide problem is virtually identical. Uh, the only difference is that the Ksp takes on a different value, and so you get a different value for the solubility. Uh, three orders of magnitude smaller in this case. And what I'll point out is that you could have actually determined that the, K that the solubility for silver iodide would have been smaller than the copper bromide by simply comparing the Ksp values. Notice that the Ksp for silver iodide is much, much smaller than the Ksp for the copper bromide. Uh, that tells you that this equilibrium reaction is shifted farther to the left for the silver iodide than it is for the copper bromide. And so you would then know that the silver iodide is not as soluble as the copper bromide. Or you can do the calculation explicitly. You have to be careful with these types of comparisons, though, because that only works when the ionic compounds in question have the same internal stoichiometry. For both of these guys, they're, you know, one to one, one to one. And so that works, uh, and so we can directly compare the KSPs when they have the same internal stoichiometry. But for a different stoichiometry, you really can't tell without doing the calculation. So I've worked it out explicitly here for the calcium hydroxide. Here the stoichiometry is different, you know, it's one to one and then one to two for the hydroxide. Okay, substitute in the solubility for the calcium and two times the solubility for the hydroxide. Expand everything out and you get this expression. And then to calculate the solubility, you would take the Ksp, divide it by four, and then take the cube root. And that gives you this number. You're going to be facing these types of problems on the exam. And so this is a very good uh, example for you to study and be sure that you can do these types of problems. And just to give you um, a little bit more of an idea of what you might face, uh, you know, for example, suppose you were given these four statements here, uh, or, or not the, the calculate, but you'd just be given the ionic compound formulas and their Ksp values. And the question would be something like, which of the following ionic compounds is the least soluble in aqueous solution? Or which of the following is the most soluble in aqueous solution? And so how you solve those problems is you set up the Ksp expression in terms of the solubility for each one, solve for the solubility, and then whichever one has the smallest value of the solubility, that's the least soluble one. Whichever one has the largest value of the solubility, that's the most soluble one. Well, I'm going to stop this video right here. We'll pick up with precipitation in the next one.